Hey everyone, we've been transitioning over to doing ground tests on the Dark Air 1, but in parallel we're also doing some work to finish up the cabin. So we wanted to show you all this starting with the testing that's being done on the fuel tanks. We also have an exciting announcement that we wanted to share, so be sure to stick around at the end of the video to hear more about that. Alright, let's get into it. We have the wing for the Dark Arrow 1 prototype off of the fuselage and we have it up on our stand here. One of the ground tests that we've been doing with the wing is actually leak testing it. We're getting ready to put fuel in both the left tank and the right tank and fill these things up. But before we do that, we wanna make sure that we aren't gonna leak fuel everywhere. So we're performing a leak check on the wing. Uh, another reason that we're doing that is we actually took a little bit of a novel approach with this wing. We have carbon fiber skins on the top and bottom, and then those are bonded together and those skins are infused. So we have a full wet wing going from the root to the tip and uh, we're relying on the skins to create a seal for the tank. The Dark Arrow One's mission is speed, range, and efficiency. So keeping the wing as small as possible, but also maximizing the fuel volume is a goal there. So for the leak checks, we've sealed off some of the vents and ports that go into the wing, and then we have it hooked up to a manifold and a pump, pulling a little bit of air out of the wing and then seeing how it performs. So we've isolated the left wing and the right wing. We're testing each one individually. Once we pull that slight amount of air out of the wing, we're seeing if it loses any amount of vacuum. Once we did that testing, we found that there was no pressure loss in either wing, which is good. So we're, we're passing our leak check there. From that standpoint, we're good to put fuel on the wing. Once we had this whole system set up, we want to do another test on the wing, which is actually pressurizing the wing. From the outside, the wing looks like a normal wing, but inside there's some unique things going on structurally. We call the approach that we're taking hollow grid. And we have a whole video on it. I'll link it up above, but we want to prove that uh, out further. We want to prove out the structures a little bit further there. The phenomenon that you can experience during flight in say like an unusual attitude, like if you have an aggressive forward slip, that column of fuel can create uh, hydrostatic pressure on the wing and it can actually balloon out the wing. And what it's trying to do is actually separate uh, the top and bottom skins from the internal structure. By inflating the wing essentially with air, we can prove out that this wing is structurally sound from that potential uh, load case scenario. So with our whole system set up, we actually pressurized each of the wings, so the left and the right, and then monitored how it performed or respond to that pressurization. So similar to doing the leak testing where we pulled a little bit of air out, we also pumped a little bit of air in and saw how it performed to that and happy to report that it performed great. So kind of further proving out uh, the structure of the wing, but also making sure that it's not gonna leak any fuel. In addition to those two tests, we also tested the vents, making sure that the vents are working properly. So when we're doing our positive pressure test on the wing, we actually made sure that we could get air to come out of those. Once everything was looking good with the wing, we were ready to install it back onto the fuselage and then perform some further control system testing. So let's look at that next. Another piece of ground testing that we've been working through recently is measuring the compliance or stiffness in the control system. We talked about this a little bit in our previous video about the control system. I'll give you some more of the details on that now. We're trying to simulate aerodynamic loads on the control system and there's two pieces to that. In-flight aerodynamic loads and then ground gust loads on the control surfaces. You can imagine that in flight, we want to deflect the control surface into the airstream when we're maneuvering. And because the control system isn't infinitely rigid, when we move the control stick, we lose a little bit of the deflection that we're after. We want to maximize the stiffness of the control system, both for response, flight response, and for uh, minimizing the likelihood of flutter. And we've covered flutter in other videos. The testing for this, we basically deflect it to its limits of travel using the control stick and then try to pull it back to neutral using a load cell. We can predict the amount of restoring force on this uh, control surface, we can calculate that. So there's a specific load that we're after that we'll subject this to and then measure the deflection. So we've done a couple rounds of that testing and identified some areas where we didn't have as much stiffness as we'd like to see. A good example of that was in the armrests. Uh, the armrests support the control stick and some torque tubes and linkages, and we made some modifications there to beef it up and make it a little bit stiffer. We also identified a couple other areas that we want to modify, so we still have to do that and then complete our next round of testing to deem this airworthy. As far as acceptance criteria, if you look this up, there's very little literature published on what's an acceptable amount of stiffness in the control system. The FAA says it's up to the aircraft designer 
So that's us. A couple of the things that we're thinking through as we write up our acceptance criteria is um, actually varies based on which piece of the control system we're looking at. So for the ailerons, for example, we want to maintain enough stiffness, obviously for flutter resistance, but also for control responsiveness. We want to maintain an acceptable roll rate for the elevators and pitch. We want to maintain enough control authority to flare the aircraft on landing and have uh, good stall recovery characteristics. Uh, so those types of edge scenarios feed into our acceptance criteria. That's the in-flight aerodynamic loads. The ground gust loads are in the opposite direction of the in-flight loads. You can imagine if we were sitting on the ground and a big storm blew through and we didn't have gust locks installed, you could actually blow the control surface against its travel stop and potentially cause some damage. So we can calculate upper limits on these gust loads and then do a proof load on the control surface to validate that gusts are not going to cause damage to the system. Using the same load cell, we can pull this control surface against this travel stop uh, up to that calculated load and ensure that there's no damage in the system and prove it out against uh, gust loads. So that's uh, kind of the high points of the testing of the control system. I'm going to hand it off to Ryan to talk through some of the work that he's done in the cabin of the aircraft. I wanted to show you guys a seat belt that we've installed in the Dark Arrow 1. There's actually multiple different seat belt or restraint systems out there, um, ranging from just a simple lap belt all the way up to six, seven, or even possibly more point um, restraint systems. To put it simply, the more points or restraint belts that you have in your safety system, the more you're going to be prevented from moving in the event of a crash. The human body can actually withstand drastically more uh, peak loading conditions during a crash, the more you restrain it during that crash. The, the lap belt and shoulder belts do the majority of the restraint during a crash, but there is still an effect called submarining where the pelvis can rotate and translate forward in the seat during a crash and then the lap belt starts to ride up higher on the soft tissue abdomen region which puts a lot of loads where we're not really supposed to take loads. For the Dark Arrow 1 we went with a six point harness which is actually going underneath my lower thighs to the same mounting location as the lap belt and so sitting here in the aircraft it feels pretty good it's still pretty comfortable I can still access all of the instrument panel and controls that I need to during flying and it will prevent me from moving forward in the event of a crash. Because the Dark Arrow is a more reclined seating position for comfort during long range flights, it's more susceptible to the submarining effect if you were to get in a crash. So adding the six point anti-submarine belt was a safety necessity. An additional thing to mention with all of these harness straps is sometimes we need to exit the aircraft pretty quick. So we're using a crow safety harness here, which has got a two inch cam lock. All I need to do is move this tab. Everything is detached and I'm ready to exit the aircraft. As you can see, the pilot seat belt is fully installed now and ready to go for flight testing. We want to end this video by talking about something important, which is that we're hiring. The Dark Arrow 1 is all about advancing speed, range, and efficiency. This has been the only project that we've shown publicly, but there are other exciting aerospace programs that we are involved in. We do a lot of engineering and manufacturing work on other new designs, enough that we're growing the team to accomplish more and move faster. We're looking for engineers and technicians to help design and build new aircraft with unique capabilities. If you want to become part of the team, check out our careers page at the link below to learn more. Thank you all for watching. We'll catch you next time.